Pastor Rogers here. It's nice to see you, gentlemen. Uh, I have the privilege of sharing with you this morning an interesting topic, and uh, the topic was kind of given to me, uh, but I thought this is really good because nobody preaches on this. At least I've never heard anybody preach on it. This concept of stones of remembrance, stones of remembrance, and you probably, unless you have been talking with somebody here who is planning this conference, have no idea what that means. So um, I'm excited to actually talk a little bit about that because it's part of my people's history, but it also speaks to us as followers of Jesus today. Uh, and as we start, let me just pray. Avino Vimolcano, our Father and our King, it says in your word that... Uh, Stones are actually really important. Uh, when it comes to your glory, it says that even the rocks will cry out. When it comes to your son, it, you, you say that he is the rock of our salvation. When it comes to our faith, we are supposed to plant our faith on a firm foundation on the rock. So we thank you, Lord, that you have brought us to such a faith that we can be sure and secure in sort of this solid relationship with you that is represented by something as hard and as durable as rock, as stone, as granite. Lord, I pray that the words that we read today are yours. We pray that the, uh, the words that I speak are informed by you and that we might grow closer to you as we are contemplating how in the world we can reach the world with the message of the rock of salvation, your son. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Well, just as a reminder, I am with Chosen People Ministries. Uh, we're not just in Chicagoland. We're in 19 different countries. Uh, I am the Chicago and the Midwest Regional Director, and I get to work with a lot of wonderful other missionaries, especially younger ones that are growing. And ministry is booming like crazy right now at Chosen People Ministries, and sometimes I feel like I get to guide it, and sometimes I feel like I get to hold on to it. Um, some things that you might want to pray about. We're praying about opening a facility in Chicagoland, um, praying about location, praying about staffing, and praying about, um, obviously, cost. But the opportunity is there because we have growing staff, we have excited staff, and I just don't know if it's going to be in the suburbs or in the city, and if we're quite ready for it yet. I see it. I've seen it, our other staff do it in other places like New York City and Tel Aviv and Berlin, Germany, but... Man, I'm just, I'm so on the cusp of this, and I just would love your prayers for this. Sorry, this is, there we go. Okay. I would love your prayers for this, because we are reaching more Jewish people than ever before. We are reaching more Christian people, uh, and when I say reaching Christian people, that's an interesting concept that I'll actually talk about in this message, um, because it's Christian people that help us reach Jewish people. It's people like you who help us reach Jewish people with the gospel. Um, I'm not going to give my whole spiel about where I am, uh, where I'm from and all that stuff, because you've heard it probably three or four times now. I'm actually going to get uh, straight into the word. So turn with me to Roman, uh, Romans, different message, to Joshua chapter 4. What in the world, what in the world, if we can go to the next one, is stones of remembrance. Joshua chapter 4. Starting in verse 19, now let me set the scene for you. How many times did God part the waters for the Jewish people? Once? Twice. Right. When was the first time? The Red Sea. When was the second? The Jordan River. So what happened was the Jewish people are slaves in the land of Egypt. God brings them out because they call for deliverer. Moses is this deliverer, and he brings them into the wilderness. But in order to get into the wilderness, God parts the Red Sea and lets them pass through on dry ground. And that divides the Jewish people from the pursuing Egyptians. And now they are with their God, their Savior. The only thing is they walk into a wilderness with no infrastructure. So God lays out an infrastructure, but this infrastructure is only supposed to last for maybe a few months until they get where? Where is their ultimate goal? The promised land. The only problem is this people who was just saved by miraculous means gets to the promised land, sends in 12 spies, and do you know how many spies come back with a good report? Two. That means 10 thought, these people are giants, they're too big for us, we can't do it. Meanwhile, they don't remember 
what God just did for them by toppling over, essentially, the Egyptian kingdom. And so they're made to wander for 39 and a half more years. And finally, the first generation, the generation that actually came out of Egypt, they die off except for two people, and all of the people's kids are the ones that are allowed to go into the promised land. Moses is not even allowed to go into the promised land. Just Joshua and Caleb. And when it's finally time to move into the promised land, God once again parts the waters. They cross on dry land, they cross the Jordan River into the promised land. And so this is, this is that triumphant moment. This is the culmination. Look at verse 19 of chapter 4 of the book of Joshua. Now the people came up from the Jordan on the tenth day of the first month, and they camped in Gilgal on the east border of Jericho. And these twelve stones which they took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up in Gilgal. Then he spoke to the children of Israel, saying, When your children ask their fathers in the time to come, saying, What are these stones? Then you shall let your children, uh, knowing, say, Israel crossed over this Jordan on dry land. This is a repeated miracle. This is very similar to the miracle that God already did. Verse 23, for the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan before you until you had crossed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up before us until we had crossed over. God is in the mood to bless people and to perform miracles for people and to deliver and to follow through on his word. Verse 24, that all peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord, that it is mighty that you may fear the Lord your God forever. And there's a lot of really key points in this small passage, but I love this point at the end of verse 21. What are these stones? You know, what's really interesting, this summer I was driving around with my kids in the Galilee area of Israel, and we saw some people had stacked stones. I mean, like precariously stacked stones where if a really strong wind came by, it might have actually blown these things over. Other times, it was just a pile of stones that was not a natural pile of stones. And inevitably, my sons would look out the window and say, Abba, what's that? Abba, Dad, what's that? To which I had to say, I have no idea. But somehow, Joshua understood that if they set up this memorial these stones of remembrance, these 12 stones, that not only would God be remembered for parting the waters, but he would be remembered for so much more because this people didn't even deserve to be in the promised land. They had done nothing of their own accord. It's just because God said, I will bless the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I'm not going to let you stay in the land of Egypt as slaves. So I'm going to bring you out. I'm going to rescue you. I'm going to give you miracles. I'm going to sustain you in the wilderness. I'm going to give you food to eat. I'm not going to let your clothes wear out. I'm going to give you water from the rock. I won't even let your shoes get wet when you cross the river or the sea. Then you'll remember, verse 24, the hand of the Lord. The hand of the Lord is almost always either the Savior, the Messiah, or salvation. And that's exactly what this is. The Lord brought them from slavery in Egypt, even though it was a 40-year circuitous route, to the promised land. My brothers and sisters, that's a metaphor for our lives even today. The Bible tells us that we are slaves to sin, but we can find freedom in Christ, and the only way is for the Lord to deliver us out of that sin to bring us to the promise of freedom and forgiveness. Now, if you've never seen that metaphor, that's a big deal. But this is what God intended, that salvation alone belonged to him, that everybody, when they saw these 12 stones, should remember that something incredible happened, and they should reflect on God because of it. Now, what in the world does that have to do with my ministry? Number one, The reason I'm doing my ministry is because the Jewish people are still here. The Jewish people are still in our world. 
And the only reason that's the case is because the Lord delivered us. And not just delivered us from Egypt, not just delivered us from Babylon, not just delivered us from the Assyrians, not just delivered us from King Artaxerxes in the story of Esther, not just delivered us from the Inquisition, not just delivered us from, keep naming persecutions, right? My people should look to the God who saves. My people should look at the stones in Israel and remember him. My people should look at the fact that Israel, the, the, the state of Israel, is now a growing country and should not think, hey, this is because of our own ingenuity and fortitude, but this is because of the God who saves. Not just physically, but also spiritually. But stones are really important in Judaism in general. If you go to the, oh, right there is good. Has anybody been to Jerusalem? A few of you? Did you go to the Mount of Olives? Do you remember what was on the Mount of Olives? What? There was, there was a few olive trees left. But the Mount of Olives today, which overlooks the old city of Jerusalem, is a giant cemetery. And you might go, why is it a giant cemetery? This is a giant Jewish cemetery and the reason is because Jewish people believe in the resurrection of the dead. My grandma didn't know that until my dad told her after he came to faith in Jesus. But we believe in the resurrection of the dead, uh, technically, although most Jewish people don't talk much about it. And the reason is in the book of Zechariah, um, it talks about the Lord. He will step foot on the Mount of Olives and he will enter Jerusalem. This is the concept of the day of the Lord. We would think that's his return as followers of Jesus. Jewish people think it's his first coming. Regardless, that's when Jewish people think they will rise from the dead. And so if you're wealthy enough, you can purchase a small plot on the Mount of Olives, and you can have a burial there. But notice one other thing on these, these graves. What do you see? Stones. Yeah, it's one of these weird things. In Jewish cemeteries, you know, even in Illinois, you won't go to a Jewish cemetery, cemetery and generally find flowers, which is sort of traditional in America. Instead, you will find people that have put small pebbles, small pebbles on the headstones, small pebbles on the, uh, the enclosures. Now, why in the world do we do that? There's lots of thought behind this, but there's two that are pertinent to this message. Number one, it's a reminder that we are connected to that person. That we have visited and we still remember that person. Second, there's this little play on words or sort of a pun in Hebrew with the word pebble. And the word is tsror. We can't usually say it in English. Tsror. But sror also means bond, okay? And there's this prayer that we say when somebody passes away called El Male Rachamim, which means God full of mercy. And in this prayer, it says, Vayitzror b'mitzror chachayim et nishmato, which means that you be bound up in the bond of life for your soul. Now, that sounds like a weird phrase, but it comes from 1 Samuel 25. And the idea is this, that we should not forget anybody. That the Lord is the author of life, and somehow we are still connected to that person. That's kind of what these stones mean. Regardless of going into the detail about this weird, odd, odd practice... The point is, when you see stones on a grave in a Jewish cemetery, you know that this person has connections to life. It's not dissimilar to the reason that Joshua set up these stones of remembrance. Now, I realize those were because God did a miraculous act. This is because we believe that God is the author of life and hopefully will one day bring these people back to life but there is this weird sort of in-between period where we remember them. They're still, a, they're still connected to the, the, the land of the living, so to speak. But in the end, it's ultimately God who provides life. 
So what in the world does that have to do with us today? You can go to the next slide. The question is, how, how should we think of that as followers of Jesus? This concept that these stones connect us to the living, but also the fact that God is the author of life. And remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So there's a life beyond just breathing, right? So turn with me to Acts chapter 6. And this is an exciting one for me. It's one that not a lot of people talk about, at least in this way. As followers of Yeshua, what or who could be stones of remembrance for us? What or who could be models for us? What or who remind us of God's goodness, especially when it comes to this topic of evangelism and missions and sharing the gospel with other people? Who is our example? In Acts chapter 6, we see the church growing very, very fast. And very early on, and by the way, for everybody who says we want to be like the first century church, I, I don't get it. Because there were problems, okay? Every church has problems, and that's okay. That's why the Lord is good, because he's involved in everything. But there were problems early on in the church. And you see this really interesting administrative problem that they try to tackle. But they allow God's Spirit to intervene. So watch this in Acts chapter 6. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. The Hebrews, the Hellenists. So there were Jewish people who were from the land of Israel. They would be called the Hebrews. And there were Jewish people who were from abroad and who were more Roman-like or Greek-like. Hellenization really means Greek, but... It's the Roman Empire now, but the point is they were more metropolitan. And so there were two different types of essentially um, Jewish elderly women, and they were fighting amongst themselves in the church. They all believed, but they were fighting amongst themselves. Because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So these were poor people, these were poor widows, and they were given food on a regular basis. And apparently, one of the groups was being favored by, uh, by the people who were serving. Verse 2, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. Now, if you've ever heard this passage preached before, it's probably been to justify a pastor or an elder's job. My job, partly, as an elder or pastor, would be, like it says in Acts 6, to pray and teach the Word. I'm not arguing against that. I'm not really making fun of that. But I want to turn this, this passage on its head a little bit. Look at, verse, uh, look at verse 5. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. This seemed to be a good, a good thing, because in verse 7 it says, then the word of God spread, right? But I want you to look at the qualifications once again in verse 3. Seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, that's one, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom. Good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit, and full of wisdom. Those are the three qualifications. Now, when this passage is normally preached, it is normally, like I said, to describe a pastor's role within a local congregation. And that's not necessarily a problem. But oftentimes, what we do in churches is that we look for people to serve. We look for people to clean up the building. We look for people to vacuum. We look for people to prepare the coffee. Do we look for people who are full of the Holy Spirit and full of wisdom and good reputation? Now, this is not necessarily a recipe, but 
Usually that's not in the, uh, the purview of whoever's administratively overseeing the servers of the congregation or the local church. My point in all this is that the people whom they assigned to serve widows' food were top-notch people. Any person who was full of the Spirit, good reputation, full of wisdom, would probably be a worthwhile pastoral candidate in most churches in the United States. Am I right? Okay. These people were excellent quality people. Now, it doesn't mean that only uh, excellent quality people can vacuum. That's not what I'm saying. Okay? And it doesn't mean that poor quality people can't vacuum. That's also not what I'm saying. Can of worms here. My point is that when they looked for people to serve... They were excellent quality people. You might think that, okay, that's fine. So Stephen and and Prochorus and Nicanor and all these wonderful future baby names, they would, they would, you know, they're gonna stay in their lane and they're only going to serve the widows, right? That's their job. Not part of my job description to do anything else. I'm not gonna take the elderly to their doctor's appointment. I'm not going to serve with the children. I was given a job, and I'm going to serve the widows. Hellenists and Hebrews, it doesn't matter. I'm serving everybody equally. Sometimes we have a closed mindset like this. Sometimes we think, well, listen, I'm I'm just really good at this. This is pretty much the only thing I can do, so I'm just going to stay right here and do it. But Stephen, Prochorus, Philip, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas... They were exceptional people. Now, you probably remember the story of Stephen, right? Stephen got got himself into a little bit of trouble, right? He got himself into trouble. He was dragged before a Jewish council. There was a guy named Shaul there, Saul, who held the coats of people who stoned Stephen after he gave one of the most impassioned gospel presentations through the history of the Jewish people in the entire Scripture. And right before he passed away, what did he see? Do you know? He saw his Savior, Jesus, in heaven, basically waiting for him. But this guy shouldn't have been in that situation. He should have been just serving the widows, right? If he had just served the widows, he wouldn't have died. Nobody thinks of Stephen that way. But I don't want to focus on Stephen, believe it or not. I want to focus on Philip. Go to, go to chapter 8 for me. And here's where we're going to get. The stone of remembrance is this guy, Philip, that you don't see anywhere else in Scripture except for these two chapters. What an incredible example not for me necessarily, and not for Pastor Foote necessarily, but for everybody who has never held the office pastor or missionary in this room. So yes, there's going to be a little bit of a, a, little bit of a push today to be missionaries. Every single person in this room to be missionaries. Because Philip was only supposed to serve the widows, but you're going to see that he did a whole lot more. And I'm going to tell you a story before we read chapter 8. I was speaking at a church in North Carolina, sort of in the middle of nowhere, wonderful little community church. And afterwards, I was waiting by my book table, just patiently, kind of twiddling my thumbs because nobody, uh, nobody really wanted to talk to me until finally a young couple came out and they beelined for me right as I was starting to close up my book table. And they said, we love everything that you talked about. We are so impassioned to reach Jewish people with the gospel, but we live in the middle of North Carolina because he, young couple in their 20s, he was in the military and she was a teacher and they couldn't leave because the base was there. And we want to support your ministry, not only financially, but we somehow want to figure out how to reach Jewish people with the gospel ourselves. And I said, that's incredible. And so we talked a little bit more. I got to know them, and I finally prayed for them. Well, the next day, I decided to kill some time by going to the local mall. And sure enough, there's a young Israeli selling Dead Sea products in the middle of the mall. That's what I was looking for. 
And I knew somebody would probably be there. So I go in, I start talking to her, and it turns out she's very interested in, the, in, in things of faith. The only problem was I was leaving the next day. And so what do I do? I go back to this young couple because I, I don't live in North Carolina. At the time, I lived in New York City. I said, please, can you meet this girl? Can you take care of her? She's alone here. She doesn't have any friends. Can you just befriend her? Ask her to come to dinner at your house. You know, bring her some dinner if she's working or bring her lunch. Just befriend her. Be kind to her. Show her Jesus' love. And they were like, yes! You know, finally, we could tangibly reach a Jewish person with the gospel. That's the sort of stuff I'm talking about. And that's exactly what they did. In fact, I would keep up with them, and they would call me, and they say, oh, so we had her over for dinner, and um, she spent Saturday with us, and we just hang out, and we watch movies together. Oh, and guess what? She finally came to church with us. And I'm like, this is fantastic. You're a teacher. You're in the military. None of you have... <laughs> Bible training. None of you went to missionary school. None of you went to seminary because you know what? You don't need it not to share the gospel. Did Stephen have seminary training? Nope. We don't even know that he even saw Jesus in the flesh. We have no idea except for when he saw him in heaven. Do we know about Philip? We have no clue if he even saw Jesus. But look what happens with the story of Philip. Verse 26, chapter 8 of the book of Acts. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. Now for someone who is very rigid in their faith, they would have told the angel of the Lord what? I'm sorry. I can't do that. I have to serve hummus today. Right? My job is to serve the widows. But somehow, I suppose the Lord thought, you know what? I can use Philip in multiple ways. Verse 27, So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. This relationship between the Ethiopians and the Jewish people spreads back all the way until uh, the time of Solomon, believe it or not. So the Ethiopian, they, the Ethiopian and the Jewish uh, relationship was, um, was a long time. <laughs> and so this is, I mean, they, they had some knowledge of faith in God. And so Candace, apparently the queen of the Ethiopians, sent this guy, this eunuch, to not only worship, but probably to bring a gift for the, uh, for the temple in Jerusalem. So he was leaving. And the angel told Philip to go meet this person. Um, verse 28, he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading Isaiah the prophet. Then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asks Philip to come up and sit with him. This place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to a slaughter, and as a lamb before its shear is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. This is the passage, Isaiah 53. It is one of the most beautiful gospel presentations, and it was given 700 years before Jesus. It tells about Jesus. Verse 34, so the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom... Does the prophet say this of himself or some other man? Then Philip, opened, then Philip opened his mouth and began at this scripture and preached Jesus to him. This is a time when you say to yourself, how can Philip do such a thing? How did he know what to say? Did he have enough training? Did he have a certificate? Were hands laid on him that he could go and share the gospel with other people? Did he have the go-ahead of James, the brother of Jesus, the head of the Jewish believing community in Jerusalem? Or did he have the, the blessing of the elders and the pastor to go and share the gospel? The answer is no. He didn't have training, not 
like we have training today. He didn't have seminary. He didn't have rabbinical training. All he did was sit at the feet of the teachers of the book. And he sat with his fellow believers, and presumably they spoke about the Lord. They spoke about God's word. They spoke about new people who had been accepting Jesus as the Messiah. That's all he knew. He knew that Jesus was the Messiah. And the Spirit of God moved him way out of the way. This wasn't a convenient thing for him, right? This was, he had to go from Jerusalem to a desert place as the eunuch is going back to Ethiopia, back to Africa. My brothers and sisters, sometimes we feel that we can't share the gospel with somebody. We're too timid. We don't know enough. I don't know if I should say something. I'm afraid of what they might think of me. I'm afraid they might make a scene. But I'm telling you, the same qualifications that were in those people that they chose in Acts chapter 6, good reputation, full of the Spirit, and full of wisdom. If you've put your faith in Jesus, chances are you probably have at least two out of the three, but probably three out of the three. These were high-quality people then, and if you've put your faith in Christ today, chances are you're a pretty decent quality person, which means that the Lord can use you like the Lord used Philip here, because it says that Philip didn't go on his own to do it. It says an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip and told him to do it, which means the Lord prompted him. Now, if I asked for, for hands, uh, I'm sure I'd get a number where, you know, has the Lord ever prompted you to say anything to somebody? Chances are probably good that some of us would say yes, but some of us might go, I've never really been prompted by the Lord. Well, I think you probably have. You just weren't paying attention or you didn't realize it was the Lord's prompting. So what happens here? Philip leads the eunuch to a saving faith in Christ. So much so that the eunuch wants to be immersed immediately. Once again, Philip was nobody special. At least he didn't have the title of apostle or missionary or elder or pastor. In fact, his, type, his title was food server. But God used him miraculously to share the gospel with somebody in an out-of-the-way location. And then guess what happens? Look at verse 39. Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more. I'm just pointing this out because this, this guy transported through time and space. The Lord thought he was important enough to his kingdom work that he transported Philip through time and space, and then all of a sudden, verse 40, he's in a place called Azotus or Ashdod, many miles away, transported through uh, space and time. For anybody in here that has an attitude of, it's the missionary's job to share the gospel, you're right. Or it's the pastor's job to share the gospel, you're right. But if you were to say it's their job alone, you're wrong. Philip is a stone of remembrance for me because we don't see much about him. All we know is that he has a good reputation, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, and he listened to God. And then when given an opportunity to open the Scriptures, to share Jesus with somebody, somehow he just knew what to say. Maybe it was because they had just gone over that in the Saturday service the weekend before, or maybe it's because God gave him the words to say at that moment. I tend to think it's probably a little bit of both. But if you have the Spirit of God, then you are able to do the exact same thing. And if you've ever read the Word of God, if you've ever sat in a church, then chances are you have a little bit that you can share, and that's all you need. If you only have John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, and whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. If that's all you have, that's enough. So I'm standing up here as a missionary saying, please do my job with me. I just want to get paid for it. <laughs> God 
God just did an amazing thing in the book of Acts. Jesus died and resurrected from the dead. Then he ascended to heaven. Then 3,000 people came to faith in a single day in Acts chapter 2. And now all these people are acting on behalf of God's kingdom to share the gospel. And so when people ask, what are you doing? Why are you doing these things? Philip can say it's because of Jesus. Stephen can say it's because of Jesus. Paul can say it's because of Jesus. Peter can say it's because of Jesus. Remember that in the Bible it says that even the stones will cry out. The stones that Joshua set up, they didn't say anything. But they were evidence that God did something amazing. Now you and I can be stones of remembrance where we actually cry out. We actually give a little piece of information. We actually share a little tidbit of the gospel. You don't have to get the entire gospel out. You can get a little seed of it out. You can get a little morsel of it out just to whet their appetite. You can show them the love of God that you have for them because Christ died for you. Therefore, you love them. That's what happened to my wife yesterday. She's not employed by Chosen People Ministries. She's my wife, but she wants to share the gospel with people. She saw a woman at Panera, because I lovingly gave my wife time away from our children. (laughs) And she was convicted that day as she was reading through the scripture that she should love the odd ducks of the world. Does anybody know odd ducks? If you don't, you're probably the odd duck, right? And in walked a woman who was talking to herself at Panera. And my wife goes, oh my gosh, there's literally an odd duck right in front of me. She goes and orders her soup and sandwich, and she has the gentleman carry it to the table, and she says to the gentleman, I'm so glad you could do that, because if I did it, I would probably spill it all over the place. And then my wife realized that this woman had a tremor, okay? Her hands were shaky. And my wife thought to herself, that is the worst thing you could have ordered, (laughs) tomato soup. And so my wife watched her as she tried to serve herself the tomato soup. I can't say I would have done this. I can't. But my wife told me. She said, so I went over to her after a few minutes, talking to the Lord. And I sat down at her booth without asking and said, can I help you? And the woman looked up, kind of shocked. Now, what's the worst that could happen in this situation? That she starts yelling at my wife and screams at her and says, How dare you? I'm perfectly capable of doing this on my own. That could have happened. But that's not what happened. Instead, she said, You know, a lot of people, when they look at someone in a wheelchair, they'll ask to help them. But they don't think of a sort of a a disability of the hands. And she says, I can do it, but thank you. And my wife said, okay, well, if you need any help, I'm right over there. And she walked away, and my wife started kicking herself. And I asked her why, and she said, because I didn't tell her about Jesus. And so she asked the Lord, please give me another opportunity. And the woman came over to her again as she was finishing the meal and said, you know, I appreciate your help. I can't actually take the tray to the trash. Can you help me? And my wife said, absolutely, I'd love to do that. And when the woman asked, why are you doing this? She said, because Jesus loved me so I can easily love other people. Now, it just so happens that my wife got a little blessing from the Lord yesterday because the woman's face lit up and she goes, you're talking about Jesus. I love him. (laughs) And then they bonded over it. But imagine if she had never heard about Jesus. Imagine if she had only been given hard time her whole life and nobody ever helped her. This couple that helped this young uh, Israeli woman in North Carolina, we kept in touch. The young Israeli woman visited my wife and me in New York. There's a really long story uh, there, but we shared the gospel with her several ways. Um, uh, She hung out with other young Israelis who I think were running a, um, a human trafficking ring. And then She came back to us and she said, those are the people living the life that I thought I wanted, like living the high life in New York City, but they're disgusting. I want a life like you and Ryan have. That's what she said to my wife. We shared the gospel. Then she moved to Alabama, and that couple from North Carolina moved her to Alabama. And then somehow, a Christian housewife 
just took her in also and shared the gospel with her over and over again. Finally, she called me and she said, I think she's ready to accept the Lord. The reason I'm telling you this is because people like Philip are stones of remembrance. They are an encouragement that you don't need a degree, you don't need years of expertise, all you need is the Spirit of God living inside of you, and you become a conduit of his gospel. Let these examples, like Philip, like Stephen, be encouraging to you. So I'm going to give you a challenge. I don't do this normally because I can't stand when people do it, but I'm going to give you a challenge. Over the next three weekends, ask the Lord to put you in a position where you can share just a little bit of his good news. You don't have to share the whole thing, but if you can share a little bit of his good news with one person outside of this building, you will be part of exponential growth. I'm going to close with this. Turn to Romans chapter 11. And by the way, it's only because a Christian businessman shared with my dad that I'm here today. It wasn't his job. He, his job was to sell insurance. But it's because he shared with my dad that I'm here today. Because my dad came to faith through that. And then I came to faith through that. Romans chapter 11. Look at verse 13. It says this. For I speak to you Gentiles inasmuch as I'm an apostle to Gentiles. I magnify my ministry if by any means I may provoke to jealousy those who are my flesh and save some of them. Now, it's a very interesting way he says this. Obviously, he wants to reach Jewish and Gentile people alike, and he's reaching a lot of Gentile believers in Jesus. But now he says there's a way that you can help in this, you know, in, in reaching the, the people of, that, are, that I have a broken heart for, my own people. He says to Gentiles, he doesn't say, I speak to you who are future pastors. I speak to you who are future missionaries. He doesn't say that. He says, I just speak to you guys who are not Jewish. I magnify my ministry if somehow you guys turn around and share the gospel. So if you're in this room and you've put your faith in Christ, you have opportunity to reach a lot of people with the good news. Paul even said this was a great model to employ. I'm sure if you brought people here, Pastor Foote would share the gospel with them. But you know what? The best place to share the gospel with anybody is where you are with them at that moment. They don't have to sit in a room. It's not magic in here. Two last things. Um, I have some of these on the table. There is a slip. If you'd like to fill out this slip, I will give you a free book. This slip allows, you to, uh, allows me to write a monthly prayer letter so you know what's going on in our ministry and how you might be able to pray, how you might be able to help. There's no financial obligation. But if you give me one of these and you're not already receiving our prayer letter, I will give you a free copy of Isaiah 53 Explained. Lastly, I'm going to give you a very practical way that average everyday people can share the gospel with a Jewish person. Um, but it's a big thing at the same time. We started a, a network called Host Israelis. Uh, every year, over 40,000 young Israelis travel around the world from New Zealand to South America to the United States and Europe. And we have started a network of everyday Christian homes who are willing to host them. You set the rules. You can say only one person allowed, only two people allowed, only women allowed, or whatever. You set all the rules, but this is a way that maybe if somebody's coming through Wadsworth or Northern Illinois, um, you might be able to host them, give them a meal, talk to them, hear their story, and then they'll inevitably ask you, why in the world are you willing to host young Jewish people from Israel? My brother did this recently in the, the D.C. area, Washington, D.C., and he said, Ryan, it was so much easier and more casual than I thought it would be. He just wanted to hang out with us for a few days. He was only supposed to stay two. We invited him to stay four. And then he even went to our congregation with us. And, all, and what, that, what, means, what that means is you've become a part of the chain of witnesses that the Lord may use to bring them to him and his son. So if you're interested in that, I have brochures about that as well. This is a thing to definitely pray about. Don't just say you'll do it. Um, and there's a training process that goes along with this so you can 
get more information about that. Let's pray. Lord, we praise you and we honor you because the earth is filled with your glory. The heavens declare it from one end to the other. Even the rocks that you created create, uh, tell us of your glory. Give us evidence of your goodness and your creation. I thank you, Lord, that you gave us examples of people that have um, cut the path before us and shown us that we don't have to be some sort of super genius or have a special training in order to tell people about your son. As long as we are in touch with you and we have your spirit living inside of us, we are able to tell people about your son. Lord, I pray that you would bring people across the paths of the individuals in this room so that they might be able to just share a little tidbit of the good news of your son. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.